So then, and that's how it takes on, because one of the other things you said in this essay, and I want you to, to explain um, how affirmative action fits into this and the types of policies that this leads to. But you said that weirdly, you know, you feel vindicated by a lot of how, how things are sort of moving. And, you know, if, and again, if I'm reading you right, it's because of this, this interesting move that you're catching where it's some of the most sort of things that might seem aesthetically the most radical are just moral improvement projects that appeal to the anxieties of the white upper middle class primarily and then get sort of go through a cycle where they're completely divorced from you know a material agenda um is, is am i reading you right and then that basically you need that and i'd like you to talk about that too because you do get to it very concretely including with uh, affirmative action which i feel like people don't talk about nearly as much anymore but it's still obviously a really important policy area yeah you know it's interesting that people don't often enough don't talk about affirmative action explicitly but they do talk about it implicitly by way of diversity and equity Right. And to be honest, I'd prefer that they talk about it as affirmative action because affirmative action gets an unfair, bad rap. Uh, and and I think the failure to talk about diversity and equity as affirmative action helps to fuel the unfair, bad rap that it gets. Because, you know, it's been a, as long as it's been affirmative action, it's been illegal to have quotas in employment for racial minorities and women. Right. And yet people presume that that's what affirmative action is. Uh, because of decades worth of the rights attack on affirmative action and, and other anti-discrimination programs. And frankly, you know, neoliberal Democrats like Bill Clinton giving too much ground to the right on on the framework in the 19 in the 1990s. Um, the diversity and equity version of affirmative action uh, really kind of reifies race in ways that affirmative action, in, at least in origin, didn't have to race, gender, fill in the blank in a way that. On that, I, that's really important. Sure. Well, way back in the day, uh, when you get Title Seven, uh, and then the first round of um, when EEOC, by the, so Title Seven, nineteen sixty four, and the EEOC finally has teeth in the early nineteen seventies. Um, affirmative action functioned as a kind of anti poverty program, and it wasn't supposed to function alone, right? It was. It technically precedes the War on Poverty, but the War on Poverty presumed that what I should say policymakers in the war, but the war on poverty can't presume anything. The policymakers associated with the war on poverty presumed that the, the bulk of racial disparities could be attributed to some combination of the cultural deficiencies of, well, first you could say depressed demand. Um, so insufficient growth, the then beyond that macroeconomic th issue, uh, the cultural deficiencies of the poor blacks and brown people or Appalachian whites for that matter, right? So the underclass broadly defined uh, and of course, racism, right? Discrimination. And so on some level, anti-discrimination policies were conceived then, uh, and, and this is true from their original conception as an anti-discrimination project, as part of a broader anti-discrimination project, which is great. Now, of course, the problem is that in the context, as we, I think, probably talked about before, in the context of the mid-1960s, that would be insufficient because of the other macroeconomic things that were going on. But, but those policies were necessary, even if they were insufficient. As we move forward in time, though, uh, you know, 1978 forward, basically, the way that people talked about affirmative action was less about anti-poverty. And I, and I would like to, to complicate the anti-poverty piece just a minute, but I'll come back to that. But less about anti-poverty and more about, well, diversity. And what diversity presumes is that by the 90s easily, it, it proceeded from the view, it's an ethnic pluralist framework, basically, that within the heart of every black person or in the part of every Hispanic person or in the heart of every woman, you know, fill in the blank, is an essence that's there. Uh, and so for all intent and purpose, uh, the defense of affirmative action by way of diversity would center on the notion that 
black people, brown people, uh, whatever their sex, women, whatever their race, would bring some quality that enabled them to essentially speak for the tens of millions of members of their group. So this is what makes it kind of ethnic pluralist like because it you know proceeds from the same view. Now like just yeah, so can you just give us 30 seconds on what ethnic pluralism means? And ethnic pluralism is a construct that gains a lot of traction post-war and it's bound to an, a formal rejection of scientific racism, so that's good. But instead of completely rejecting the idea that there's some intrinsic quality to ethnic groups and, it, and of course it rejects race in favor of ethnic groups and ethnic groups are supposed to be determined not by biology but by culture right so a midwesterner could be an ethnic group technically but the way that um the ethnic pluralist talked about culture was actually a lot more like race because they presumed that after generation after generation after generation of an irish person in america um that person would still have some essence you know, five generations later after the potato famine or whatever. Okay, so you could say like, okay, like, you know, Liam, your family has lived, I'm sorry, I'm going for it, lived in uh, Stoughton for five generations, but I really would like to have a better understanding of, uh, of, of the potato famine. Can you tell, what what is the Irish perspective on that? That. Because married, is, well, it wouldn't be genetic, cultural memory. Right. But if we consider the fact, so it's technically, rhetorically, it's culture, but considering the fact that, let's say, there might not be any connection between Liam uh, and Ireland at all, then what's the mechanism? Or for that matter, Liam's parents and grandparents, and I guess technically that would even give us the great grandparents too, then what would the mechanism be for Liam still having some connection to Ireland since it's not a cultural exchange because it can't be that because he's not in Ireland, nor were his parents, nor were his grandparents. And if they've moved to the suburbs surrounded by Polish Americans and Italian Americans and wasps, many of them coming from blended families or whatever, uh, mixed ethnic group families, and you still go to Liam, even though Liam is just the suburban white guy at this point, right, uh, to speak on Irish potato famine, then that's not culture that you're talking about. <laughs> that's got to be race because there's no exchange right? There's no contact there. And I, I, I love your, your example, because I, I will share one anecdote. I have a, had a student, a graduate student who's re really great, but she was Irish American and she had taken a trip to Ireland when she was a kid with her parents to connect with their distant cousins or whatever. And she was so excited. She was probably like seven or eight. She was so excited. And she said to her cousins, you guys are so lucky you live in Ireland because you must get to le eat Lucky Charms every day for breakfast. And they looked at her like she was out of her mind. They went, what the hell are Lucky Charms? But the kids speak version. And she explained it to them. And they were they thought she was nuts. And she was completely crestfallen. But she had a fictive, very much shaped by American culture, understanding of what it meant to be Irish American. Like, you know, you know, like all ethnic racial groups would about their homeland several generations removed. So the diversity piece is kind of ethnic pluralism. And we've moved away from a kind of anti-poverty understanding of affirmative action towards this thing, uh, which is in step, this diversity framework, which is in step with, um, you know, the return of scientific racism on some level, or at least the rise of neoliberalism. And, and frankly, it does, it can lend itself to rather unfortunate, ugly exchanges. Um, I, I don't think it's actually out of step with Amy Cooper's dealings with Christian Cooper, to be honest, because if she assumed, so I'll go this route. Tony C. Coates had written an article called Beyond the Code of the Streets that came out, I want to say, in 2013. Uh, my friend Pascal Robert had done um, an essay on this, and I read it a couple years after the fact and was stunned by it because, according to Coates in this essay, uh, in the heart of every 30-something-year-old black middle-class professional beats um, or in the chest of every 30 something year old black professor beats the, the heart of someone who has some street ways in him, right? Um, read it. I'm not making this up. And when I read it, what I was horrified by, and this will get me to Amy Cooper, is I had had white classmates and white coworkers at jobs, good and bad alike, who actually had that mindset about black, they're just waiting 
like they interpret uh, the hurt look in the eye of a black coworker because the the black coworker or brown coworker is hurt that a colleague said something that was unintentionally uh, unkind and perhaps a racist, racist or racially informed way, they interpret that as anger and hostility, right? Um, so, you know, there is this filter that people operate with, but interestingly enough, I think the diversity framework, I, because of, of what it is, um, doesn't really help that cause. And I say this as a, a defender of affirmative action. And one other thing I want to say about it as an anti-poverty agenda is that, you know, I mean, I, it's also clear that middle class at this point in the post-industrial era, that white collar professional middle class uh, or managerial class types benefit from it probably disproportionately, right? This is something that A. Philip Randolph and Byron Rustin predicted uh, when they were making the case for the freedom budget for all on top of you know what would eventually be called affirmative action. So I, I think that's that's pretty uh, pretty apparent. But some people will hear what I'm saying that affirmative action defended as an poverty rather program rather than diversity as a dig or a case for just a class version of affirmative action. But the fact of the matter is, and I'll leave myself out of it and point point to my parents. My parents were well educated black people, and and they, the only reason they had access to the jobs that they were actually qualified for uh, in the 70s was because of affirmative action. Were it not for affirmative action, they wouldn't, they, they probably still would have had gainful employment, but, but white collar managerial class employment would have been out of their reach because of employer discrimination. Right. That's how it can function still and function as an anti poverty program. I could still hypothetically get a job in the post office if it still exists um, without affirmative action, maybe. But would I have the same access to the professoriate in the absence of affirmative action? Would women, would there be as many white women, let's say, because uh, I know white people don't think, don't realize that white women actually are the beneficiaries of affirmative action and only imagine that it's, it's black and brown women. But no, I mean, numerically, I think it's pretty clear that white women have been the principal numerical beneficiaries of affirmative action. Would there be as many white women um, medical doctors or lawyers or professors? I think it's pretty clear there wouldn't have been actually because before affirmative action, there were very few of those those people, right? So it still has that function. We just don't talk about it that way at all.